We're with Barbara McHugh, author of Bride of the Buddha from Monkfish Publishing. The people at Boulder Bookstore in Boulder, Colorado have sent Barbara a list of questions. So, Barbara, just to start with, could you give us an idea of what the book is about? Sure, uh, the novel, first of all, I wanna thank Boulder Bookstore for allowing this video. Uh, in the background is not Boulder Bookstore, but a banyan tree, which actually plays some parts in my novel, so I thought it would be appropriate. Uh, the novel is about the Buddha's wife, and the name of the novel is Bride of the Buddha, and the Buddha's wife's name is Yasodhara, and he abandons her when he goes off to seek enlightenment. Uh, in my novel, I deal with her spiritual quest, which takes her strange places, and she ends up back in the Buddhist community, the monastic community the Buddha is founded, disguised as a monk, the monk Ananda, who eventually is the monk who has convinced the Buddha to admit women to his community. So could you um, also give us a, a short reading, please? Okay, so I'm going to start fairly early in the novel uh, when Yasodhara, or Yasi, as I call her in the novel, is 10 years old and her seven-year-old sister dies accidentally and Yasi blames herself. She tells herself that Deepa, her sister, can't really be dead and she decides to visit the charnel ground to West rescue her. Obviously, Yasodhara needs to do this without her family knowing. The night after Deepa's funeral, the moon, three days past full, rose late, but well before midnight. I slept in the same room as my three older sisters, and now I had to wait for their steady breathing and little snores before I could start my journey. As I crept down the wooden stairs to the side entrance, the air was sour and weighed down with stale incense from the previous day. And I kept thinking of my mother's description of the charnel ground after dark, foul and slithering with ghosts mourning their lost flesh and driving living beings mad with fright. But when I opened the door to the outside, the fresh night atmosphere braced my spirit and pushed away my fears. To the east of our family compound, the lopsided moon was, moon was big and yellow. Although its light was still weak, it sufficed so I wouldn't need to steal a lamp. All I took with me was one of my own saris to wrap deep in so she wouldn't have to return home naked. I wore my dark blue day shift, which would be easier to run in if necessary. The windless night, cool and contrast, contrast to the dead air inside our house seemed to heat up as I made my way to the packed dirt road that went around our village. A cluster of 12 two, two and three story wooden dwellings and 30 straw and wattle huts. A few scattered lamps glimmered faltering yellow light. The entire village looked to be asleep. Not that I walked in silence. Frogs and crickets clamored and dogs barked, echoing through fields of freshly sown millet mist gray in the light of the rising moon. I was glad for the creature's noise. It would mask any sounds I might make. As I, walk along, as I walked along the empty road, my fear, which I tried to ignore, began to swell up, tightening my chest, and making it hard to place one foot ahead of the other. I reminded myself I'd never seen a ghost, unlike almost everyone I knew, so I wasn't afraid of them. After all, those spirits, those roving spirits never did anything. Still, anxiety sped up my mind, spinning off new problems. I had to face the possibility that Deepa really was dead or that she died when they brought her to this terrible place. If so, I would have to beg her spirit to return to her body. I'd try to reason with it. What good was a spirit without a body? And if her soul was hurrying off to another life, did it really think it could find one better than Deepa's? We had a wealthy father, a loving mother, beautiful sisters, a house full of servants, a brave older brother dedicated to protecting us. Deepa's spirit could end up inside a dog, 
especially considering that recently we've made fun of one of those wandering ascetics who imitated dogs as a way to purify his soul. What if our heedless play created bad karma, which forced Deepa into the animal realm? By the time I approached my destination, the moon was shining in my face, making it impossible at first to make out the bodies and bones, except for dark patches and faint white shapes. The voices of the little night creatures echoed ominously in the stillness, but at least the vultures were gone. I increased my pace as if I could leave my trepidation behind. Then I hit a wall of stench that knocked me to my knees. The other times I'd seen a charnel ground from a distance and it had been downwind. Tonight there was no wind at all. I held my nose but the smell leaked in a combination of feces and decaying flesh, yet worse. It had an ultimacy about it, as if it were the very source of every foul odor in the world, one warning me to run from it as far and as fast as possible. I staggered to my feet and forced myself forward. I had yet to arrive at the charnel grounds proper. Deepa, I cried out, hoping she would come to me and we would both flee this wretched stench but all I did was momentarily silence the crickets. I kept walking, gagging with every step, preoccupied with the odors so, so much that I didn't realize I'd reached the grounds until I almost walked into a bloated corpse, its huge pale face inflated almost bursting, its mouth a writhing ball of worms, black excrement for eyes. At this point, my body heaved, the smell of my own vomit knifed up through my viscera. It actually provided relief from the smell of death, but not from the horror pounding through my veins as I stumbled up the slope, the sickening crunch of rotting bones under my feet. Now on the charnel hill, I could see well enough and it was horrible. I had to get Deepa out of here, but where was she? I dodged an armless skeleton and another naked corpse, this one face down, arms and legs flung out at impossible angles, as if the body had been tossed carelessly from above. Where were the spirits? By now I was in the center of the field, the moonlight turning the corpses a glistening gray and the bones chalk white. Deepa, I called out again and again. I screamed when I almost stepped on what once had been a baby, its head little more than a mashed piece of fruit, its mouth an empty hole in the center of its face. Reflectively, I looked up. Surely the spirit of such a little one would still be hovering above its body, unsure where to go. Then I realized there were no ghosts, no souls, only people who had turned into things. These things were far more awful than mere objects, more soulless than anything that hadn't had a soul to begin with. They seemed to deny the very possibility of souls, not to mention life itself and the warmth and bright, light, vibrancy of love. Far better to be haunted by armies of roving spirits, even demon spirits, than to have the image of these corpses settled in my heart. But now they had, forever. A shapeless new fear lurched up inside me, one I couldn't articulate at the time, didn't want to in any case. Cold sweat sliming my body, I kept on. These things were not Deepa. Deepa was alive and trapped here, and only I could save her. I broke into a run, passing a heap of skulls, trying to make out her shape on the slanting moonlit ground. Deepa. Then, praise to the divas, I saw her familiar form, silver pale in the moonlight, up the slope just two or three body lengths away. The vultures hadn't touched her. Touched her. Why would they? She was alive, lying much as she had on the plank behind our, water, our altar. I started toward her, but a sudden sound made me stop. My engrossment with the smell and the sight of the corpses plus the bleed of the crickets had prevented me from hearing the other noises all around me. The sounds of feeding. Wild dogs, a good 30 of them, had spread over the field singly and in groups, growling and gulping as they fought over the core. I could see them clearly now, gaunt and ragged ear, snarling and snapping with jagged rows of teeth, polished white by moonlight and their greedy saliva. One of them was headed toward Deepa. 
I broke into a run and reached her first, throwing my sari over her and snatching her up. She was heavy as stone and oddly stiff, from fear I told myself, but I had no time to think about this. Staggering under her weight, I backed away from the dog, which was almost as tall as I was, only to have another one join it. They crouched down, one black, one a scruffy gray in the moonlight, as if about to leap, their growls growing louder. I was terrified to turn away from them, which in all likelihood would prompt them to launch themselves on top of us. Go away, I shouted in my most fearsome voice I could imagine, I could manage. Now two other dogs approached. I slung deeper around, holding her collapsing form in front of me, pain clenching my arms. Wake up, I screamed. We have to run now. Her, her weight was getting unbearable and she didn't move. I turned her stiff body to face me. Wake up. Then I saw her face without expression, mouth half, op half open. Her eyes were also partly open, cold dull slits in the moonlight, as uncaring as gashes in stone. She was a thing. She couldn't be my sister. The first dog jumped, landing on the corpse's back. If I didn't let the dog have it, he and all the others would tear me to shreds. I dropped, dropped it and ran. I didn't stop running until I was halfway home. Then I fell and lay face down in the middle of the road, sobbing into the dirt. All I could think of was a hollow shell of deepest, deepest absence, now filled only by the horrible image of her as a thing. Then another image came to me, and the shapeless fear I first struggled against in the charnel field finally took form. I too someday would be a thing. So would everyone I loved and everyone else, from the strongest warrior to the youngest baby. No, I shouted into the night, and the village voice, the village dogs erupted barking. Reflexively, I filled with hatred, then I stopped. They too were going to turn into things. Why hadn't I see, seen anyone's spirit? Had they left the corpses to go live elsewhere? But what could spirits possibly be without bodies to give them form? I struggled to my feet and started walking, not caring if the dog clamor I'd caused wake, woke up villag villagers who would drag me home to be punished. No matter if my mother locked me up in some room, with this newfound knowledge of death, it didn't matter where I ended up. The dog racket died down, followed by the tiniest puppy yelp. I jolted to a stop, remembering the deepest spirit might be in a dog. Was it possible? That's what the wanderers were trying to find out. At that moment, the only worthwhile pursuit seemed to be the search for spirit. Under the white misshapen moon, I, down and prom I knelt down and promised my sister that I would find her soul so she could be with her family again and not have to travel through realms of samsara, lonely forever. As soon as I was old enough, I would go forth into homelessness and become a wanderer myself, uncovering truth. I had no idea I'd end up marrying a man who would one day be the Buddha, who would abandon me to go on the quest I'd planned for myself. I resumed walking. Back in the charnel grounds, the moonlit feast went on and on. Wow. So Barbara, could you talk about your inspiration for this novel? Well, one of the things was that I had met many women and I felt myself uh, turned off by the fact that the founder of this religion had abandoned his wife and baby to go seek enlightenment. And so I had a desire to explain the story to myself and to investigate it. Uh, and to counter some of the misogyny also that appears in the early suttas. So that, that started me working toward finding out what was going on in the suttas. Uh, I was inspired by the other women in the Buddhist story. Pajapanti, his stepmother, who, who walked 350 miles bare, barefoot only to be turned down when she asked the Buddha to join the Sangha and until Ananda got her in and persuaded the Buddha to admit women. I was also inspired by the other women in the Theragatha, which are suttas composed by the earliest nuns. Uh, I was inspired finally by the figure of Ananda himself, the, the monk who persuade, persuaded the Buddha to admit women. 
Um, he supported women in other ways too, such as encouraging their participation in the Buddha's funeral rites, which really got him into trouble. And I have that in the book. Uh, anyway, he represented traditionally the compassionate, loving aspect of Buddhism, as opposed to the ascetic aspect. And so that conflict inspired me. Uh, also, I was struck by the anomalies of the stories about Ananda, about Ananda that really cry out to be accounted for. Like he's, here he is, an unenlightened monk, persuading the Buddha to make this major change in his community. And how does this work? I mean, the Buddha's enlightened. He doesn't need someone unenlightened to give him arguments that, you know, he's, he must have thought of himself already. Uh, also, the, the Ananda remained unenlightened until after the Buddha's death, which is also very strange because most of the Buddhas, all of the Buddhas, really closest associates, just became enlightened like that around him. And so what was going on here? I wanted an explanation. And uh, one of the explanations was, well, maybe he and Yasodhara were the same person. They were both renowned for their physical attractiveness. They were both first cousins of the Buddha. So as I was reading and studying and thinking about writing this book, it came, that came to me. Well, maybe they were the same person. And I really re resisted doing the gender switch at first. But after a while, it just became more and more compelling. And I had to do it. And I suppose my greatest inspiration then becomes the Dharma. You know, the, the uh, promise that has to see things as things really are. And only then, I think, you can you solve these existential problems with death, pain, and suffering. Finally, I think this has to do with the Dharma and the ascetic versus the loving aspect of Buddhism. The key conflict that, uh, that really I became obsessed with that exists in most religions, including Christianity, is how to love the world and at the same time, uh, how to transcend the world. And I think this is dramatized in my book in many ways, but particularly in the relationship between Yasodhara and her son. And I think this basic conflict can't be reduced to formulas or one side is right and the other is wrong. But I think that most people have to live with it by day by day by the choices we make. And the only quote that I can find that sort of, sort of expresses this conflict for me is a Vedantic conflict, a Vedantic quote that um, a lot of Buddhists like to use. And it's this, wisdom tells me I am nothing. Love tells me I'm everything. My life is a river that flows between the two. So uh, what kind of research did you do while writing this story? Well, I read a lot of the Pali Canon, which are the oldest, oldest scriptures, English translations. I'm not a, a, a scholar. I don't pretend to be that deep in, into it. But uh, many episodes of my book are based on stories from the Pali Canon. Um, it was trans, transmitted orally by monks for 500 years after the Buddha's death before it was written down. So it, that means it wasn't written down until about 35 BC. And Pali is a vernacular of Sanskrit. Um, actually, the Buddha supposedly spoke Mag Magadha, which is another dialect of Sanskrit. But anyway, I read it in English. <laughs> uh, it's my pseudo reader also. My pseudo reading also included a two-year course in the Majjhima Nikaya, which is a set of discourses from the Pali Canon. Uh, there are four major collections of scriptures, and. Uh, the Majjhima Nikaya is from the Sutta collection. It's over 1,300 pages long. These suttas are long. I mean, I, I have all of them, and they're about this wide when you put them all together. Uh, for Christmas, my husband gave me a copy of the Anguttara Nikaya, which is over 1,800 pages long. So I could, my work is cut out for me. I also used uh, a lot of modern scholarly works and commentaries. Uh, cultural criticism, such as by Richard Gombrich, uh, Stephen Batchelor, Bhikkhu Bodhi, Tanisari, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, um, the Venerable Anand Lyle, and Karen Armstrong, which is some of the people I used. And all of them really sort of sharpened my understanding of the doctrinal conflicts in the Buddhist time, which really, have you know, have persisted until now. And I use that to sort of 
uh, give my characters motivations and uh, different visions of reality. Uh, I've been to India a number of times beginning in the 1970s, um, staying in ashrams. I've gotten a sense of North India, the heat, the vegetation, the terrain, and even the people, because even now, 2,600 years later, they're wandering holy people. And even people on the street love to wander and talk about God, which I ran into some when I was, in, during my travels, what, through the 90s, actually in the, in the aughts as well. So uh, I, I got a sense and I really wanted to write about India, although I don't think I could ever write about modern India. I don't, you know, it's, it's very different. Uh, finally, I mean, I went to the internet and found all kinds of conflicting stories and legends from the uh, tradition. And uh, legends like that Buddha and Ananda were born on the same day, as well as Ananda was born on the day of Buddha's enlightenment, which gives a 35 year difference of how old Ananda could be relatively to the Buddha. And both scenarios are pretty much impossible. Uh, if, if Ananda and Buddha were born on the same day, um, that would be very strange because Ananda was Buddha's attendant at his own old age. And at 80 years old, he would have had trouble sort of doing the things he had to do for the Buddha. Also, the Buddha treats Ananda like a much younger man, a much younger monk. Um, also, there was this tradition in ancient literature that close associates were born on the same day. In fact, uh, 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 um, Yasodhara, the Buddha, were supposed to be born on the same day, as well as uh, Mangalanda and, and Mangalana and Sariputta, the Buddha's main disciples, were supposed to be born on the same day. But the other alternative, of the alternative that uh, the Ananda was born on the day of, of Buddha's enlightenment, would mean that he would be five years old when he persuaded the Buddha to admit uh, women to the Sangha. So I obviously chose a compromise in between those two ages. So um, uh, how did your background in religious study and your practice uh, in Buddhism uh, inform your writing? Uh, a lot. Uh, my practice is a kind of research. I've, uh, I mean, I've been practicing for since the 80s. And uh, I've certainly been involved in spiritual movements from, since the 70s. And uh, I've attended many, many residential uh, Buddhist retreats, uh, mostly at Spirit Rock in Marin County, but also in other places. And uh, for the last 20 years, I've been attending retreats two or three times a year. So uh, in the terms of meditation in the books, I. In my novel, I use my own experience meditating to uh, describe it and describe uh, different experiences that Yasodhara slash Ananda has. Uh, I also attend a progressive Christian church who uh, accepts us Buddhists. And uh, plus, uh, my study of theology and religion and literature informs the themes of the book. I have a PhD from the uh, Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Uh, affiliated with UC Berkeley. And so I, so all the questions that arise in the, that, uh, in the book that I don't treat as, you know, long philosophical arguments, but they inform, I think, the entire feeling of the book. And uh, which is uh, things like, what is enlightenment? What is salvation? What is the self? What is real love? So all these themes, you know, have been informed by the studies I did back when I was getting my PhD. How much of this story is based on what's actually recorded about Yasodhara? Um, a lot and hardly anything. Uh, first off, the basic story that the Buddhist left her to go off and seek enlightenment, I use in the book. You know. Also, I, uh, her parentage and the fact that she was the Buddhist's first cousin also I use in the book. Uh, but in fact, in the Pali Canon, in the oldest scripture, uh, Yasodhara, is, Yasodhara is hardly mentioned at all. And she's never mentioned by name. She's referred to a word that means Rahula's mother, Rahula being uh, the Buddha's son. Uh, so she does not appear in the, in the scriptures after she releases her son, she relinquishes her son to join 
the Buddha's all male at that time community. So she's pretty much a, you know, a, a blank slate. But there are many legends about her later materials. And a lot of these stories I have her dismiss as rumor. There was one rumor she was pregnant for six years. Uh, all during the, the whole time that the, the Buddha was going to seek enlightenment, she was pregnant. And there's another rumor that she joined the Sangha, the Sangha and became enlightened. Um, and then there's the whole story of her being born on the same day as the Buddha. I also have Yasodhara as a sort of diss some of the more outrageous Luddhist legends about the Buddha, such as the Buddha's total ignorance toward death. Um, so parts of the story are pure f fiction. Um, Yasi's adventures with the hill people. Um, although the, uh, the, so the Sakyan clan actually interacted, interacted with hill tribes. So it's not completely out of, out of possibility. Um, also her Ayasi's disguise as Ananda, I call this conjectural fiction. I mean, it didn't happen, but it might happen. And who knows, maybe it did happen. Uh, actually, and also Anand, um, Yasi's uh, siblings are fictional. Uh, doubtless the Buddha's wife had siblings, but I use the siblings in this novel to uh, create the story. So why do you think it's important to have a story about the Buddha's wife? Well, uh, first of all, that feminist objection about, you know, we need to hear the point of view of the woman that the Buddha abandoned. Uh, and, and we need to understand why that happened and who the person was who abandoned her. And I actually have a friend who read the book and said it made her forgive the Buddha, which I thought that was great. So that sort of a theme I really wanted to be able to express. Um, also, the need to see history from a woman's viewpoint, and all kinds of authors are doing this now. Uh, there's a book on Circe by Madeline Miller, which is a wonderful book. Circe being the, the supposed witch who uh, seduced Odysseus in the Odyssey. Uh, there's also a book called The Passion of Mary Magdalene, who uh, writes about Mary Magdalene in relationship with Jesus. It's Elizabeth Cunningham, a wonderful book who really gives you a, a quite, a, quite a story of Mary Magdalene. And she, she emphasizes, and I like to emphasize too, that it's the woman's story. It's not the story of the male hero or God or whatever from the woman's point of view. It's their story and how they function in the, the whole cosmic figuration of things. What do you hope people will take away from this story? Well, I hope people get more of a sense of the importance of seeing women at the center of the whole human endeavor, the whole, the whole purpose of life, of the evolution of life for everyone to look at it. Uh, to see women as default people, the same as men, by which I mean, so when you mention person, you don't automatically think of a man. And now when I think of Ananda, when Ananda, I don't automatically think of a man or a woman. I just have the sense of a person. And in this, related to this, is what I think art always tries to do, which is introduce new possibilities of being, new possibilities of perception, of the relationship to the world, nature, the universe, how to define the self. I mean, in this book particularly, how to define gender, which of course is being explored throughout our culture right now. And I like to look at it as a matter of with gender defining versus characterizing, which one of my teachers loves to make this distinction, that when you define something, you limit it unnecessarily, whereas you characterize it, yes, she's a man, he's a woman, whatever, they're, they're queer, straight, LGBTQ, but there's a characterization, not something that will limit you and define you totally. You are beyond that. We are beyond that. It, the self is a mystery. Uh, anyway, another possibility is how to be when you're in your 70s. I have older people in this novel doing important things and being active and learning. And I think that's something important to uh, convey. And finally, I just hope to, uh, to uh, propagate an appreciation of the Dharma, uh, the desire to learn more about it.
it's been important to me and I think it, it's important to this society and to the human race at this point. So what have you been reading in this time of pandemic to keep yourself sane? Well, I don't know if I've kept myself sane, but reading, I've been reading, rereading a bunch of old books. I was actually reading about people reading old books, so I started doing it myself. By old books, I mean books on my bookshelf. Middlemarch, the Victorian novel, and uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved, which I was so glad to take the time to read, to reread, because talk about introducing new possibilities of being. That's a book that does that. So that, that's kept me sane. Uh, then Circe I read, and um, Mary Magdalene, and, and a wonderful book by Barbara Quick called The Valdi's Virgins, which is yet another female-centered story about uh, you know, a famous man and what the female point of view is. Uh, so I've enjoyed historical novels during this time just to give me a perspective out of this sort of, oh, we're all stuck in this horrible place and it's bad, to be able to take a step back a few hundred, a few thousand years. And finally, I've decided that I need a perspective of a few billion years. So I've been reading uh, Bill Bryson's A Brief History of Almost Everything which starts with the Big Bang and talks about uh, the beginnings of life and uh, the beginning, you know, how evolution works and geology and all kinds of things. And that I found extremely comfort comforting during this time, comforting and inspiring. Remembering that, you know, our, hist our little place on earth here is very, very small compared to cosmic time. And it's just nice to have that perspective sometimes. Well, um, thank you for that. And um, thanks to Boulder Bookstore for their support and interest. Barbara's book is available from all of the usual major vendors, but we hope that you will uh, help support independent bookstores like Boulder Bookstore. I'm sure there's a place near you that could use your business. Please visit Barbara's uh, website to find out more about her, about the books, see some of the wonderful reviews she's been getting. Thanks.